this week we're talking about video games and art. Um, and so as I mentioned earlier, uh, we will be looking at games from a slightly different angle today. We're going to be kind of looking at how technology and aesthetics from games have been used to create art um, in different contexts, uh, like gallery exhibitions and curated art um, exhibitions. And we'll kind of look at a little bit of the discourse around that and some of the different examples and um, think about how that kind of interacts with how we think of games uh, in a more you know traditional context. Um, so I'm just going to go through these. I'm going to show some examples. I'll talk about a few different concepts. Um, and if you have any questions, as usual, feel free to put them in the chat or just talk on, on your mic um, and we can go over stuff. Um, but yeah, there's just some examples. I think some of this stuff is pretty interesting to look at and think about. Um, and there's a lot of other examples. As usual, this isn't really exhaustive, but there's some links at the bottom to some of the sources that I'll be uh, referencing. Um, so if this is something you're interested in, there's a lot more to explore. Um, so anyway, um, we can start talking about video games and art. Um, this image is by a, an artist named R. Smith. and uh, it's called The Last Brawl, and you guys might recognize it from uh, looking similar to The Last Supper, um, which is a very famous uh, painting of, uh, you know, from Christian um, uh, history uh, and art history. And this one is all the uh, Nintendo video game characters replacing, um, or not just Nintendo, there's some other, other franchises in there as well, but... Uh, uh, different video game characters replacing the original um, people in the painting. Um, and so I think it's kind of a funny example of, you know, uh, the aesthetics of video games and uh, video game art combined with uh, what we kind of think of as traditional art or, um, you know, things from art history. Um, and so I'm going to start off with a quote from uh, a video game. Um, this doesn't quite fit. Let's see, there we go. That looks good. Um, so this is from a collection of video games that was curated by the MoMA. Um, and uh, in the, it's kind of, I, I, I find this quote to be kind of funny because they're kind of trying to do two things at the same time. One is kind of like reach their curatorial voice into the game world while at the same time keeping the game world at arm's length by referring to um, uh, are referring to video games as existing in sort of like this design space rather than art space, which like, you know, you could argue back and forth about what the difference is between art and design is. That's not really the point. The point is that the MoMA as this big cultural institution is kind of trying to have it both ways by you know, having an exhibition and a collection of video games, but also sort of saying like, you know, this isn't real art. This is this is this other thing we're talking about. So anyway, the quote is, our video games art, they sure are, but they are also design. And a design approach is what we chose for this new foray into this universe. The games are selected as outstanding examples of interaction design, a field that MoMA has already explored and collected extensively, and one of the most important and oft-discussed expressions of contemporary design creativity. Our criteria, therefore, emphasize not only the visual quality and aesthetic experience of each game, but also the many other aspects from the elegance of the code to the design of the player's behavior that pertain to interaction design. And so again, I think this is just kind of like a funny quote to kind of um, capture or summarize this sort of like tenuous relationship that the art world and art criticism, art curating in general has had with the game world where there are, there's plenty of game developers and game designers who um, are inspired by art or might think of their work as, as existing in an art context rather than a gaming context. Um, and of course, there's this. Uh, there's plenty of video game developers and designers and players who could care less about whether or not video games constitute art. Um, and so there's a lot of different kind of like perspectives on this. And um, I think it's interesting to kind of start with this this idea of art. The you know the this sort of question of are video games art has sort of framed the conversation around video games for a long time. Um, especially early on when video games were a very new medium, people who are you know, used to criticizing or talking about film or visual art or TV or these other 
uh, mediums that are have been around for longer kind of struggled to talk about video games and understand them in their sort of native context. And one of the ways that they kind of tried to do that was by recontextualizing them as art, which I think is more what's happening in here than any kind of like serious um, uh, consideration of what games really are. Um, so anyway, uh, let's continue and just and look at some of the examples. So art games. Um, We'll look at a few different types of games. Art games are, um, we'll see like actual playable games that are designed with this sort of artistic output in mind. So rather than having a goal of, you know, uh, making it all the way to the end of the dungeon or save the princess or collect the most coins, the goals in art games tend to be more abstract and they tend to be more aesthetic, like creating sound or creating visuals. Um, and a lot of the art game, a lot of art games can be really interesting. They, you know, lead to new types of aesthetics and uh, new types of experimentation. So, um, Jaron Lanier is a game developer and technologist and person that you guys have probably maybe come across at some point. He's more famous now for um, he's well known for being sort of uh, the the founder uh, or creator of virtual reality um, of especially early virtual reality systems and experiments in the 80s and 90s. Um, but a lot of his early work is just making really weird games for platforms. And, uh, you know, we talked a, a little bit about this when we were talking about indie art, but you had to be like you know, for to make your own game in 1982, you probably had to be not just a good computer programmer, but also like a good physical hacker because you couldn't, you weren't allowed to just like write code for whatever you wanted. He would have had to actually write code and then compile it onto his own sort of like uh, disks or hard drives to run on these proprietary machines like the Atari, which Alien Garden is for. Um, so anyway, we're looking at Arian, Alien Garden, which is one of his early works, and there's a sound plays a major role in this. Um, you can't hear the sound, uh, but I recommend you you go watch this later if you find this interesting. But the the aesthetics and everything about this game really do remind us of games. It's not like completely revolutionary. He's working with sprites. He's working with simple animations. He's working with a tile map. We can see all these things that we're familiar with from 2D games being employed in this game. The difference is that there's this abstraction as to what our goal is and what we're actually doing. We can interact with these different sort of aspects of the garden in different ways, and it creates these different permutations of patterns and designs and combinations in sound as well. Um, and so you could argue, you know, that, is this a game? Is it uh, an uh, interactive art experiment or something like that? Um, but it uses the same technology. It uses a lot of the same tropes and aesthetics. And I think it's actually pretty fun. I mean, I've never actually played this in real life because I wasn't uh, alive when it was created and probably not that many people actually did play it when it was created because it was very, uh, you would have had to have the actual hardware to play it. Um, but I've watched this, you know, his work on uh, uh, videos like this a lot, and um, I think they're they're pretty cool. Um, so that's an early version of an art game. He made another game uh, of the following year called Moon Dust. Um, you can watch a little bit of that. This is a similar thing. It's using game sprites. It's using game animations. It's using some of the languages, the language of games. Um, physics and different things like that. But again, there's no real goal in these games and it's sort of uh, more about designing this space, the sound and, and the aesthetics that are happening in this game. Um, so yeah, those are a couple examples of early art games. Look at a few more. Um, Lorna uh, by Lynn Hirschman is kind of an interesting example of an interactive artwork. Um, it's not really a game in this in any kind of sense that we would typically recognize, but what it was is a like a, a laser disc uh, movie that had multiple endings, and you could choose the ending. Um, and so you would watch the beginning of the movie, and then you could choose different endings by basically choosing the chapters on the disc rather than you know. Uh, with like a movie, you you could fast forward and rewind or something like that. But with a digital laser disc, one of the new things of that technology is you could actually skip to another chapter. And so 
the filmmaker, Lynn Hirschman Leeson, used that functionality to create this sort of choose your own adventure video. Um, and so, you know, it doesn't really look like a game, but it involves this other aspects of games that um, are, you know, related to the technology, which is choice and interactivity. Um, another example in a sort of different medium is interactive fiction. And interactive fiction obviously has a lot of influence on the way games are designed, especially early on, where a lot of, uh, you know, popular games that were shared on the internet were, were just interactive fictions where you would kind of choose different branches. Maybe you'd have some sort of like resource management system or something like that. Um, Afternoon a Story is a really early example of a fiction author using interactive medium to kind of change the way that their story works. Um, so this is one that is cited as, as an early kind of artistic or, uh, or literary uh, interactive work. Um, so we're skipping ahead a lot here. I don't know if this is actually going to work. Let's see. Okay, cool. Um, so this is a project that I really like. This is by a couple of internet artists who go by Thompson and Craighead. And uh, they designed this game that's basically Space Invaders, but instead of shooting aliens, you're shooting a philosophical text. Um, and so they're sort of like commenting on, uh, you know, what the, like, the, the sort of like, what is being signified by graphics and and the framing devices of video games um and so instead of shooting aliens there's no reason why we couldn't be shooting words on the page um and i guess it's not maybe not gonna load i feel like this works sometimes and not others maybe i'll try a different uh let's see let's check the network Okay, is that gonna work? Oh no. Um, well, let's see if we can find a video of it. I think that was working recently. No. Okay. Well, uh, maybe we'll check back on this one and see if it loads in a bit. Um, but anyway, as I mentioned, it's it's kind of a joke about games. It's using game aesthetics, but instead of shooting um, aliens, we're shooting text uh, and a specific like philosophical text. So um, we'll see sort of more experiments like this. Um, this is another one by another uh, similar group of kind of like hacker artists called Jody, and they created um basically like an early mod of the game wolfenstein 3d i'm pretty sure that's what it's based on but what they did is they just deleted all of the sprites from the code and replaced them with just boxes and so again we kind of see the language of games revealed and the sort of like technology of games revealed but we're removing the aesthetics that kind of give us our context for the game so now instead of playing a game where we're like a you know uh I forget, Wolfenstein is basically you're like uh, uh, you're fighting Nazis. Essentially, you're running around and shooting Nazis in the, in like a dungeon crawler type environment. But now we've kind of reduced all of that context, all of that narrative framing, and so we just have the essential elements of a game: these like spaces and enemies and uh, blocks, and we kind of you know are navigating a maze and shooting enemies and trying to get through this experience. So. They're kind of reducing the language of games in a sense, taking away that narrative framing and replacing it with the sort of, sort of formal language that we often see in especially modern visual art where you see just shape and form uh, replacing the content of um, you know, early art. Um, so that's a pretty fun one. And you know, again, early stuff where it was hard to make stuff like this, they had to actually like hack the original code and figure out how it worked and then make this work on its own. So um, it's a lot more work that went into these types of things. Another kind of similar uh, project is this uh, interactive piece called The Intruder by Natalie Bookchin. This is a um, 
video of it, so some documentation. I don't think it still exists in a playable format, but in this version, uh, essentially the artist is taking all of these different interactive games and turning them into sort of artistic or poetic experiences by using, um, it actually uses a text by an author named uh, Borges. Um, and then it kind of puts that text into these different games. So we have Pong, um, it goes through a few others. Uh, uh, so this is kind of like you're catching the words as they're falling on the page. This is another kind of Space Invader style scene. This is uh, a scene that's based on a early uh, sort of Western game that was actually kind of controversial. I'm kind of forgetting the name of it right now, but um, it was pretty, pretty controversial, kind of offensive. Um, anyway, so borrowing from game aesthetics and game mechanics, but recontextualizing it with source material that we would typically associate with literature or um, art. Um, another interactive work, which again involves uh, modding a, an original game, is Mar Mario Battle No One, um, which is a game made by an artist where he took the, the Mario cartridge and modded out everything except for Mario and the background and the platforms that he walks on. Um, and so completely removing all of the challenge uh, and functionality essentially from the game and just creating a, a walk, well, walk simulator, a walking simulator and a sort of aesthetic experience where we're kind of like looking at the graphics now in a different context and getting a different experience from them. Um, so another uh, early AI work was this uh, game called Facade, which sort of takes on the uh, aesthetics and narrative style of a, of a play, like um, just, you know, like any kind of stage play. I think it's sort of based on um, Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf. I remember, I think I remember is that reference. Um, and essentially it's like, it uses AI to generate different uh, like paths and the characters can respond to you. So they have their dialogue and then you can write whatever you want and then they can respond. And there's only a few different paths that you can actually go down, but they do respond to what you're saying in a sort of natural way using an AI program. And so this was pretty new for 2005. You can see the graphics are pretty silly looking. It's not, um, it's, not, it's kind of an, a unique and unusual aesthetic. Um, Oh, when you ask for a watermelon, get violently kicked out of the apartment. So I guess you guys have seen this one before. Um, but it was a big, it was kind of a big deal at the time in terms of using this type of AI to create an interactive experience that really hadn't existed before. Um, it didn't really catch on. I don't think there's a lot of stuff that is is kind of made in the same vein. I'm sure there are some things that have been created that are similar, um, but it's kind of an interesting experiment in an early um, AI generated uh, experience. Um, so another game uh, moving a little bit later is called The Marriage by Rod Humble. And this could actually probably have gone in the indie games uh, one just as easily as it as it fits in here, but Rod Humble is a game developer who has typically situated his game more, his work more in an art context, where, like he shows in galleries and uh, curates um, gallery shows and things like that. Um, and his games tend to focus on very basic forms. Again, kind of stripping away the aesthetics of games to just reveal basic gameplay. So he's trying to use games and interactivity as a sort of formal medium. And he does give us a little bit of a hint about what this game is about with the title, which is The Marriage. And so once you know that the game is called The Marriage, you start to see the elements of the game, which are really simple, but you start to actually read narrative into them. 
them. So you see there's two sort of main figures in the game, which is the blue box and the pink box. And then there's a bunch of other figures in the game that are not permanent figures, all of these sort of off green, um, off white and green circles that collide with the boxes. And over the course of the game, the only thing that changes are the positions and colors of these shapes, as well as the colors in the background. Um, but it's it's hard to tell because obviously we're just watching a video, but it is interactive. You can kind of click on different elements and make, make some of the circles disappear and do different things like that. But it's sort of a simulation in a way. Um, the game kind of like takes its course depending on what choices you make, but the the uh, rules of this world are what makes it a work of art. It's not necessarily about the aesthetics. The, the aesthetics are simplified to the extent that we're not thinking about like, oh, this is a really pretty drawing. We're thinking more about like, what is the relationship between these elements on the screen and how can I interact with them? So he's taking as much away from the aesthetic experience of a game and replacing it with this sort of formal experience of gameplay. Um, so this is another approach. We've seen a lot of different approaches as to using games in these sort of uh, artistic contexts. Um, this is another one that hopefully will run in the browser. No, it's not gonna run in this browser. Um, let me see if I can find a video of it. A lot of these early uh, indie games and art games don't work anymore because they were designed in Flash, which would, would kind of work and kind of work and kept sort of limping along, but it's been recently that they finally just uh, completely crapped out and it won't play it anymore at all. Um, but I think we can find a video of it here, which I'll have to replace in the notes. Oh, no, actually, I don't think this is it. Let's just, oh yeah, it is, okay, cool. Um, and so this is a game that I like a lot. It uses really crazy uh, game mechanics where a lot of stuff is happening on the screen. You control this avatar, but it's kind of this just spiky little ball. And then actions that you do kind of affect the gameplay, but they also just open random pieces of text and poetry um, and activate different drawings. Um, and so there's a lot going on in this game. There's a lot to interpret in terms of what's being said in the text. Um, I think it's actually like this incredibly layered and interesting game, but it's like very annoying to actually play. If you if you if you try it out, you might need to use a different browser or something like that. But if you try it out, it is actually pretty fun and pretty wild. Um, and it's using these like very crude drawings that are like blown up so they look even worse than they would be otherwise. Um, and it's just kind of a wild mishmash of different stuff. Again, creating like a really unusual experience and. Uh, kind of combining uh, the aesthetics and the sort of functionality of games with this more sort of artistic and poetic uh, voice that the artist has. Um, did this one work yet? Okay, we'll come back to that. Um, another example, so we're just moving ahead in time. This is in 2012. This is more of like a video art piece, but it is it has these game moments in it, so it is interactive. It's uh, very loud, but you guys can't hear it. Um, and so it, it kind of is a collage, and it's mostly a video collage, but it has game elements to it where the user suddenly has to play, but the video is still moving. So you don't, it doesn't really, like you don't have time to like stop and figure out how it works. And so for a gamer, it's not really a game. It's not really a game experience, but for, uh, for art, for a viewer, it's kind of bringing in game aesthetics into this collage of TV and film and all of the other um, things that are used in this. Um, I think this is queued up to show, oh yeah, it's coming up in a second. There's a, you play this like s space uh, shuttle simulation game kind of in the middle of all these other clips. Um, so this is a pretty wild one. It got a lot of press at the time that it came out. Uh, I think you can still get it on Steam actually. Okay, so there's a countdown. Let's just watch this and then. So yeah, then it suddenly presents you with this interaction that you have to do and it's actually pretty challenging to get the, uh, the spaceship to stay straight as you're taking off. 
uh, and then it's just going to move on to the next part of the collage as soon as this part is over. Um, so again, we start to see games and game aesthetics kind of inserting themselves into other art experiences. Um, a program called Ruffle makes Flash games work again. That sounds interesting. Um, let's see if we can do that real quick, but it's probably probably have to spend a little bit more time on it. Oh, nice, built in Rust, that's cool. Uh, uh, let's see. It's in the web store. Add to Chrome. Okay. Let's see if that works. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. That was really easy. That's pretty cool. Um, I'd never heard of that before. Thanks, Miguel, for telling us about that. Um, so yeah, this is game, 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 and again, game. Um, let's see, how do I start? I click here. So you guys can see the aesthetics are really wild. Everything is bouncing around. Um, there's a lot of symbolism. There's a lot of like uh, religious allegories and symbolism and stuff like that that are involved. Um, but yeah, let's let's keep going. But. Uh, it's it, I would I recommend trying that game out uh, with that with that emulator that works really well. Um, but for now, let's move on to the next section. So we're going to talk about game art. So we so uh, the difference here, art games are things that are interactive, right? Like they're things that you can actually play. Um, they're games that are kind of like situated in an art context. And we see a lot of different approaches of that. A lot of uh, artists who are using the aesthetics of games and the interaction of games to uh, make their work, um, as well as game developers who are trying to reduce games into this kind of like formalist or aesthetic exercise. Game art is a little bit different in the sense that it's taking the aesthetic of games to make art. So rather than making things that are interactive, they're making things that are just typical like linear video or installation, um, but they use game aesthetics. So this is a different way of kind of repurposing game engines and, and game art. Um, a really famous one in this sort of genre is Super Mario Clouds by Cory Archangel. This is a hacked uh, uh, Nintendo cassette or um, whatever you call a cartridge. And again, it's sort of similar to the Mario Battles Everyone, uh, Mario Battles No One. Um, but in this one, he's just taken everything out except the clouds. And so it becomes this kind of like aesthetic experience. Like you could imagine making a beautiful painting of clouds. In this case, it's just the clouds from Mario just going across the screen uh, endlessly. That's the whole experience. So taking the art of games out of the context of games and then kind of recontextualizing them as art. Um, another artist that I like a lot is Edo Stern. This is a uh, video piece that he made where he took an online uh, chat forum where there's this like really intense uh, like debate slash like flame war and he animated it uh, using uh, game aesthetics and this is this sort of like new concept of um, the kind of like anonymous uh, avatar where you have your uh, your face tracking masking your real face um, it's a pretty weird piece to be honest but it's kind of funny um, and it's kind of similar to a lot of this type of work that's taking a bunch of different sprites from games and kind of mushing them together into an artwork. Um, Kool-Aid Man and Second Life is a, is a cool video. I guess it says it's age restricted. I think that's new. I don't really think, I mean, I guess there must be some stuff in here that's not appropriate, but I don't 
remember it being super crazy. Um, but anyway, this is just an interview between an artist, John Raffman, um, and another artist slash curator named Nicholas O'Brien, um, where John Raffman is basically just taking Nicholas O'Brien on a tour of his favorite places in Second Life. And so we see all these really crazy worlds in Second Life. And of course, the whole conversation is happening between these avatars, Kool-Aid Man um, and Nicholas O'Brien's avatar. And we see these different areas of Second Life that are kind of referencing works of art. And um, they have this whole conversation about digital worlds and how digital aesthetics are used in art. Um, it's actually really fascinating. I definitely recommend listening to the whole thing. Um, I don't remember it being inappropriate, but maybe there's some parts in there. Uh, but they go through a lot of different areas and look at different things, and um, it's a lot. It's a it's a pretty fun experience. Um, another one that I like a lot is this artwork. So it's a four channel video artwork called Ready for Action uh, by the artist Ken Sheely. And it's just video footage from games, like in actual games of characters waiting for transportation. Um, and so you guys might rec recognize some of these game worlds and it's just taking the main character and just sitting them in a train station or a bus station or the subway station and essentially just video recording a video of them standing there. Um, and so it's sort of like a fun, uh, funny commentary on the experience of games. Like there is this experience of real life of recreating these really mundane experiences where we're just sitting waiting for something to show up, um, which is you know unique to video games because they're interactive because they're recreating the world that we live in in many cases. So another category is the idea of machinima. You guys may may have looked at these at some at various points. Um, this is still something that a lot of people make. We're essentially, just making films using game engines. So taking a film and uh, let me turn on my do not disturb. Uh, making a uh, using a game engine, using gameplay from a game engine to create a movie. Uh, you know, with a narrative and dialogue and things like that. Some of them are more ab abstract. One of the sort of early, most famous ones is the Diary of a Camper. Um, and so this is a film that's made in a game engine. Um, and I think this is just an excerpt. I don't think this is the whole thing, um, but this is from 1996. Um, so yeah, just the idea of kind of using game engines and game spaces um, as, uh, as a film medium, essentially. Um, so a couple more examples of this. Uh, Karma Physics Elvis is a good one. This one is a little more abstract, taking these Elvis rigid bodies and just animating them over time. And uh, Molotov Alva and his search for the creator is a, another famous one where there's narration over these different scenes from the video game. So those are a few different ways in which we see games and art interact. There's a lot more out there. There's a lot more to look at. Um, I'm including uh, Games Recontextualizes Art from the MoMA show that I quoted uh, in the first slide. And so you can see all of the games that are chosen. They're all very different games. They're all, you know, for the most part, really popular games, um, which I think is kind of interesting. And they're collected at MoMA for different reasons. And they kind of will give some example of why it's been added to this collection. Um, and some other shows of art and games. Um, there's a bunch of different ones over the years of either collecting games or just exhibiting um, like a series of games or a retrospective of games or one uh, artist's work. Um, this one doesn't seem to work anymore. Let's see if we can find it. 
Okay, so I'll have to update this link. Um, but this is at the Walker Art Center. Shift Control. It's another one. Mass Mocha game show from 2001. There's a bunch more. This is just kind of a selection, but you see different examples of games being contextualized in art exhibitions. Art of video games. And then the Jason Rohr ex exhibition. This was a retrospective of his work. He was, he was somebody I actually mentioned. He made the game Passage that we talked about in the indie game uh, lecture. Um, and you can see how some of this work is exhibited with actual, you know, consoles and devices that are in the museum for people to play. Um, okay. Um, so I think that's everything from here. Um, so this is a, you know, a little bit of a different lecture from what we typically talk about, but I think it's interesting to think about how games exist culturally. And so we'll talk about that in a couple more cases. Um, and I think it's also just cool to see how other artists have used games as mediums that can give us as game de developers and designers inspiration outside of what we might normally experience um, through our, you know, just typical gameplay. Um, so yeah, I'm going to stop recording.